Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this month's webinar for the Networks of Opportunity for Child Wellbeing. My name is Rhonda Alexander, and I'll be our host and moderator today. Today's webinar, we're going to hear things um, about utilizing data to tell stories and the impact of engaging an impact on engaging policy stakeholders. Um, so, just some tips to remember um, that. All microphones are muted, so if you have comments, um, you can feel free to use the chat box, which is located in your dashboard, and you can also submit questions there. Um, this recording will be posted, and, um, or excuse me, this, this webinar will be recorded and slides will be posted. Um, and if you are interested in listening in Spanish, um, you can dial into the line or the information that is on your screen currently. Um, just a reminder for Q&A, you can use your dashboard, and here's another example of how you can access that. It's just a tab that says questions on your dashboard. Um, so I'll, sh I'll share a little bit more uh, regular overview of the Vital Village Network and the Networks of Opportunity for Child Wellbeing, and then we'll hear from our presenters, um, and shortly thereafter, we'll have time for questions and answers, and we'll close up right at 2 o'clock Eastern. So I'm excited to jump right in. So just a little bit more about the Vital Village Network. We are really committed to maximizing um, the success and, and the opportunities for children and families to thrive. Um, and since 2010, Vital Village has been working to foster partnerships between residents and organizations, really focused, um, focused beginning in Boston, focused on um, promoting child well-being and preventing early life adversity. The network of opportunity for child well-being is actually um, driven and, and influenced and inspired by the Vital Village Network. And we support communities, local communities and coalitions across the country who are interested in doing similar work around advancing health equity and child well-being and essentially helping children and families thrive. And if you want to learn more or have access to our resources, please join us at the NOW Innovation Forum. It's a national network of peer learning communities. Um, with resources and tools, blogs and stories, it's just a place where you can find stories and find out what's happening in the in communities on the ground and from their perspective. Um, and the now learning community is comprised of 10 communities across the country who've been working together for just over a year now, um, working together, learning from one another to think about how are how are we addressing issues of child and family well-being with equity and through a trauma-informed lens. So you can learn more about all of that at the network of opportunity.org. So let's jump right into it. Again, I'm Rhonda Alexander. I'm the Director of Operations at the Vital Village Network um, and for the Networks of Opportunity for Child Wellbeing. I will be your moderator today. And, and we'll be hearing from my good friends, uh, Megan Sandal, who's the uh, Principal Investigator for Children's Health Watch um, and an Associate Professor of Pediatrics at Boston Medical, uh, Boston Medical Center and Boston University uh, Schools of Medicine and Public Health. And also my good friend, Allison Bovo ammon who's the Deputy Director of Policy Strategy for Children's Health Watch. So I cannot wait for you to hear from them. So at this point, I am going to go ahead um, and turn it over to my good friend, and and we'll get started. Uh, so Megan and Allison, go right ahead. Great. Uh, hi everyone. I'm Dr. Megan Sandel. I'm really happy to be here today, and we're really excited to talk with you about how to use data to tell stories to make change. Um, the roadmap of the talk, we're going to kind of hand back and forth between me and Allison. Um, we'll talk about a Children's Health Watch if you're not familiar with who we are. Um, we're going to talk about really key strategies about preparing for effective communication. And I think these strategies, sometimes people skip over. They go straight to their messaging, and they don't necessarily spend time thinking about their audience and what they're trying to achieve and what systems they're trying to fix. Um, so we'll talk about that. Um, we'll talk about developing tools um, and how you start thinking about tools as being effective. And we're excited to share an example of this with a, a recently completed housing and health messaging toolkit that we hope you'll use in work that you'll um, thinking about how to make uh, really opportunities of child well-being in your community through housing. Um, so at the next slide, I just want to talk a little bit about Children's Health Watch. Um, for those that aren't familiar, we're a nonpartisan uh, network of pediatricians, public health experts, and child health um, 
uh, researchers really around ways in which we can achieve our mission, which is to improve the health and well-being of young children and their families by informing policies that address and alleviate economic hardships. Um, these hardships that we deal with are really common hardships, things like food insecurity, housing insecurity, um, energy insecurity, um, and others. So on the next slide, what you can see is that we have um, uh, really 20 years of data collection that we've been collecting in five cities in uh, Boston, Baltimore, Little Rock, Minneapolis and Philadelphia. We collect them in predominantly urban hospitals, either in primary care settings or emergency departments. We interview families with young children. So over the 20 years, we interviewed um, over 65,000 families of children aged zero to four because we think they are really the ones that can describe how these hardships affect health and well-being and what are the policies that actually alleviate those hardships. Um, on the next slide, we can talk a bit about the key hardships that we focus on. We focus on things like food insecurity um, uh, and what are the routes to get to food security. We talk about stable homes. What are the different ways in which people are housing unstable? How do they get to stability? We talk about energy security, not having to choose between heating your home or cooling your home and things like food and rent. Um, and then we also talk about the ability to afford health care and whether or not you're making basic trade-offs things like being able to afford medication or not seeking care because of fear of cost. And so those are our kind of four key uh, hardships that we focus on, and then we focus on the policies to alleviate them. Next slide. So um, I think one of the key things, as I said earlier, is are there ways in which you can prepare to tell strategic stories and use data as part of your storytelling? Um, I think first and foremost, when you're thinking about a, a story, you want to think about what's the problem that you're trying to address. And I think it's really easy to describe problems around individual, in, individuals, right, like families, patients, residents, what are they? But I think it's really important when you're describing a problem to talk about a system. You're, the, the individual um, family is a is living with a problem as a result of a system that is not serving them. And so therefore the solution is on the system level. So you have to describe the problem on the system level and not just on the individual level. Um, I think not only do you then have to talk about your system problem and your system solution, but really start to talk about what are the short term and the long term solutions. And then who is responsible for that system? Like who is going to be part of the, the solution, the systems level solution? Is this a federal policy change? Is it a state policy change? Is it a local policy change? Are there more than just policymakers? Are there business leaders that can be part of the solution? They're, they're not engaging in the system, and if they did, you could solve the system better. Are there other key stakeholders? And so I think as you think about it, it really is important to think about systems. It's important to think about power dynamics. Who is the one that has the power to make the change? And then who are your allies in telling the story? And I think you want to start mapping that first before you start thinking about building your narrative about how you're going to make change. Next slide. Um, I think the other piece is that as you think about a story, you want to think about who's your audience. And so obviously you want to get to the decision makers. You want the decision makers to be moved by your story to make change. Um, because let's admit that data alone is not enough to tell an effective story. So data is a piece of the puzzle, but it really is that, um, that strategy that you need to have in order to build the political will to make change. I think you want to be really clear on your messaging in such a way that you want to say whatever story you're telling, you want to make sure the message is really clear. Like, I want to have um, uh, a stable home for my patients because that makes them healthier. Right now, the systems haven't invested. That's been a choice that we've made over the last couple of years. And now we can make a different choice with a different result. Um, I think that oftentimes there are different ways to tell stories. We tend to almost always tell personal stories, and I think personal stories are incredibly effective. Policymakers particularly remember them really well. 
Um, but I do think that to an extent, there also can be organizational stories. Our organization became more effective when this system was changed and was aligned better. Um, there's community level stories, right? The story of we, what are ways in which we all benefit because of this system change. And again, I think data can be part of that story. So it used to be that you can only serve three out of 100 people, but by making these system change, we now with the same resources can serve 30 out of 100, or we can serve 100 out of 100. And those are ways in which you can use data as a way to make your point. So with the next slide, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Allison, mm -hmm. to just talk about how do you find messages that resonate. Thank you, Megan. Um, so now that you've sort of prepared for your story, you have your data, you have the audience that you want to communicate with, you've sort of mapped out um, your problem and the solutions and sort of thought about all the systems involved, now it's time to start thinking about what messages you might want to use in order to communicate your story. And I think this is where um, a lot of planning and a lot of thinking about your audience and what they know and what they don't know and sort of the, the world in which they live and the ways in which they think about things becomes really important. Because as sort of experts in the fields that you're in, we kind of get pretty deep in um, what we know and the language that we use. And that doesn't always land with broader audiences, with policymaker audiences or others. And so I think to begin, um, you know, some sort of things that you want to be thinking about are what are some of those jargon and buzzwords that maybe exist in your um, in your sector or in the communities that you live that maybe don't really resonate or have very much meaning without a long explanation um, in other um, for other stakeholders. You also want to start to think about messages that are meaningful for multiple audiences. There are some things that really connect um, across um, groups that we want to start to think about finding. So, for instance, health and well-being tends to be a value that most people across our country, regardless of your political affiliation, regardless of whether you're living in a city or in a rural area, regardless of um, sort of what level of power you have um, within a system, that tends to be something that people value and something that people kind of resonate with. And so you want to start thinking about those kinds of values that we have um, um, in our country that might be able to translate across um, issue areas and across groups. Um, and then also you want to sort of connect with people in a way in which they begin to see whatever you are trying to communicate about in a new way. We often fall into some of these pitfalls of talking about something for many, many years in the same way and thinking that that's the only way that we can talk about it. But sometimes it just takes sort of changing your messages, changing your frame to kind of get someone to sort of turn their um, view and sort of look at the issue um, in a different way. And I think one of the things you know, that Megan pointed out around systems, for example, is a really important um, component of this. We often see problems and solutions maybe on an individual level or even on a, you know, community or neighborhood level, but we can also start to think about the sort of the structures and the systems in which people live and maybe start to see some of the problems and the solutions in a new way. Next slide. So the next slide um, sort of just talks about some of the processes that you might want to use as you're um, identifying um, messages that resonate. So as it was previously mentioned, you really want to get to know your audience. You want to know what they care about. You want to know how they think. You want to know about sort of who else they're talking to, who is influencing their decisions. You also want to think about, um, you also might want to seek um, current communication research on your topic. Um, there's a lot of really great resources out there of, from groups like Framework, the Frameworks Institute, or Mission Partners, who we've worked with previously, um, who do, who are messaging experts who do in-depth research on certain topics and what words land with certain audiences and don't land. And so those are some good resources to begin with to start to seek out what other people have looked at and what is um, resonating with um, different communities. It's also, um, as I mentioned, good to sort of understand what's worked well and what hasn't worked well. Maybe you've been trying to communicate something for a long time and you're starting to see um, patterns and how people respond to certain frames. I think that's a good thing to start to map out for yourself to sort of understand 
um, this this message landed with this audience, this message landed didn't land with that audience, and really start to evaluate the ways in which you're communicating and start to think, um, start to take those things and sort of think more strategically about them. Um, and then um, and then also sort of engaging other stakeholders and communities. This is something that we have done a lot at Children's Health Watch is we've, we've developed something, we've written something and tried to think really hard about the messages um, that we're using and then taken it to another, um, to, you know, another stakeholder that we're either trying to influence or we're trying to get on our side and say, you know, what did you think about this? Did this land? Does this make sense to the to the people that you are talking with, to the groups that you're interacting with? And, you know, I found that it's really helpful to get that um, feedback of people saying, actually, if you come and talk to me about um, the importance of a stable home for the health of every patient, but don't tell me how much it's going to cost and what the benefit is um, to, you know, the bottom line on this program, then I don't really know what to do with that. And that's really important for us to sort of keep in mind as we're thinking about um, developing messages and communication strategies. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit um, more in the presentation about sort of how to identify both the core message, sort of what is the root of what you're trying to say, and then starting to think about what are some of the other supporting points around that message that you may be able to sort of swap in and out for different audiences. So on to the next slide. We'll talk a little bit about core and supporting messages. So the core message, is, as um, Megan gave a great example of, is the root of what you are trying to communicate. And this is something that I think is helpful to have written down, to have um, sort of ingrained in um, everyone that's sort of involved in the project. Uh, you know, even though there may be some sort of variations given personal style and how someone might communicate, but at the end of the day, you have your core message that you're trying to communicate. But then also sort of thinking about what are the things, whether they're it's research or um, policy work or you know program evaluation, um, things like shared concern that others may have, as I mentioned previously, um, that might be a, um, another piece of the supportive message. And then I think one component that's always, always necessary in the supporting points that you have is the urgency. Why are you coming to this person, to this stakeholder, to this decision maker now? And what do you want them to do? I think it's important when we're communicating messages that we have something that people can take back with them, even if it's just, I want you to know this information because it's happening in your community and we're working to identify a solution and we want you to be a part of the solution. That's an urgency and that's a call to action as well. So on the next slide, um, I do want to transition a little bit into um, some tools that we might use. Um, and so I think one of the things that we often um, employ in our work, we're trying to describe you know, something pretty complex like housing supports and services and um, housing production and, um, and subsidies and policy and all of these things, is that it's helpful to, to use um, metaphors often to, to sort of distill a really complex point into something that people can understand. This is a common way that we navigate our world, right? Someone um, might use a metaphor to describe something really complex and all of a sudden we understand what's going on. So I might walk outside and notice how you know, nutty the traffic is and say, oh, it's kind of like a zoo out here. And you all understand what I'm saying without me trying to describe to you what I'm actually seeing, for example. Next slide. So when we were creating talking points, we just outlined some of the things that you may want to think about um, as you're developing those talking points. So one, what is the reality? What is the situation? Can you use a metaphor in order to make that situation, uh, to describe that situation in language that someone might be able to relate to or to sort of understand um, in, a, in, a, in a different way? Again, communicating the urgency, also communicating the logic. What is, what, why are you recommending this solution? Is there data to support that? Is there previous research? Is there sort of what the community is saying that they need to, to um, solve this problem? What is the logic behind your, um, not just your, your problem, but also your solution? And then what's the reward for the person that you're talking to um, and acting that? And again, always ending with that call to action. So I'm going to, on the next slide, just turn it over to back over to Dr. Sandal to talk about 
um, a, a recent tool that we've developed um, around housing and health that helps us sort of think about um, message, effective messaging in this space. Yeah. Thanks, Allison. Uh, so uh, I will admit, I meet with a lot of policymakers over the years, and I feel like I consistently need help with how to structure the communication so that I don't get too nervous and I don't talk and babble and do other things. And so we have found more and more that having intentional message maps, ways in which we can organize kind of an arc of the conversation so that you can really feel like you're being effective in these communications and use the data, like the research that we create to change policymakers' minds in order to achieve our mission to make, um, to alleviate economic hardship for young families. I feel like this has been more and more an effective tool. So as you think about the arc of this webinar, we have talked about how you can be strategic in thinking about describing the problem, who your audience is, how you use different tools to do it. And now we're going to use this in an example, which is this um, message map that we just released on the foundation to thrive. How do we describe this problem? Uh, and I just want to pause for a second and thank the Butler Family Fund that gave us some uh, really critical funding to be able to allow us to put this message map together. Uh, next slide. Uh, so within this narrative, we have centered around a metaphor, which is really comparing the developing of a child's mental health to a growing tree. And so within that, I will admit, I'm a pediatrician. I have tended to use, frankly, medical med metaphors. I've described housing as a vaccine. It keeps you healthy now and in the future. Or more recently, we've described it as a, as a stable, affordable home is a prescription for good health. And our evolution in thinking about medical metaphors, I think, is twofold. One is, is that sometimes medical metaphors actually include jargon in them that people don't understand. And I'll go over that in a minute around why the words matter and how we need to start to be really thoughtful about what words we think are effective and then when you actually ask your audience, aren't that effective. Um, I think the second is, is I think it's somewhat an empiric question. A, a message researcher recently told me that it's somewhat a question of whether a health metaphor with a medical lens is actually changing people's minds. It may be easy to help people make the connection between housing and health, but it may not actually motivate people to make a change. And so in this particular message map, we went away from actually medical metaphors and actually used this metaphor, which we think is actually really effective. And so as you think about it, describing that a child's physical and mental health and well-being is like a tree seedling whose soil, roots, and environment must be regularly nurtured, nurtured throughout its life to establish solid roots and grow strong. And a child's mental health, similar to a tree, requires nutrients, a stable location, and that, um, that allow limited moves and displacement and stressors so that they can actually achieve their, their highest heights, right? And that by investing in safe, affordable homes with access to community resources, we can ensure that our children grow strong socially and emotionally and build resilience. So that's kind of the metaphor that sets the stage for what you're trying to achieve. Next slide. Um, as we think about that, the core message we're trying to have our audience walk away from is that the foundation for mental health and well-being is built early in life. And so that that's why focusing on young children, ensuring that young children have that foundation is essential. So that's our core message. Many times you want to um, almost say less things more often in order to be more effective. And so making sure that you're getting that across becomes really important and that your message is really simple, that somebody can remember it an hour later without having to say, what did they say? How did they say it? You want to be really super clear. But you don't want to necessarily repeat yourself too much. And so ways in which you can have supporting messages that underline your core message becomes important so that a safe, stable home is a predictor for better health. Many people are un currently unable to afford their rent or mortgage, which damages the health of our next generation. We know that unstable housing is deepening the health disparities that we're seeing, and it's also draining health dollars out of our healthcare system. And that's why we need to prioritize investing in safe, stable homes, because it supports kind of not only um, uh, individuals, but it's the overall health and well-being of our children throughout their lives. 
those are all kind of supporting message that, that reach up towards our core. Next slide. So as we think about kind of words and things that matter, what we have found is that sometimes we end up having sort of knee-jerk words that actually may underline our, or, or undermine our effectiveness. So for instance, I actually try and use the word homes as often as possible and not housing. Housing kind of feels like a unit. It feels kind of sterile. It doesn't feel, it doesn't have that emotional tie that home does. And so we're trying to have stable homes for uh, healthier kids, not more housing units. And so thinking about that can be really important. Um, we have found that uh, sometimes even secure housing, sometimes people think that means like locks on the doors. And so we end up saying it's really about consistent homes, stable homes, homes you can afford um, are really important things. Um, I think sometimes we uh, default to talking about it as a crisis, as a way to get to urgency. And sometimes crises can feel paralyzing, that you can't solve them. And so we've tried to say this is a really important issue that we need to solve today through new systems. Um, I think similarly, you don't want to be too um, uh, stereotyping, talking about multi mental illness or disorder. You really just want to talk about mental health challenges that and conditions that we all have in our families and face and that we can be together stronger. Um, similarly, things like children suffering or a victim is not the same thing as children experiencing those challenges. And you don't want to be um, uh, demoralizing as you're trying to describe the, the topic. Similarly, I think it's more important to talk about displacement than gentrification. Um, uh, and that it's really about strengthening children's empowerment. Even the word empowerment sometimes has a backfiring effect about you should be pulling yourself up by kind of your own bootstraps. Um, and I think it's really describing that children can be at risk of things um, and are experiencing homelessness. So instead of um, labeling someone as a homeless child, it's a child that's experiencing homelessness, but that can change. Next slide. I think that one of the things that is really important is that as you think about what is the problem you're solving, what's the system you're trying to change, therefore what core messages do you want to use, and what are the core messages that you're trying to achieve, then you think about your venues of putting those messages into action. And so there's a lot of different ways you can do that. You can do that through media, kind of earned media, things like op-eds, writing those at all levels. You know, some people aim for really high levels of op-eds like your, you know, New York Times or Washington Post or in Boston, the Boston Globe. But I'll be honest, op-eds I've written for a local neighborhood paper like the Bay State Banner, which is located in like one neighborhood of Boston, I think are as effective at reaching audience members sometimes as it is higher levels. So op-eds can be at all levels. Um, social media posts more and more, sometimes just literally tweeting at a policymaker, they read those, their staffers bring those to them. And so using social media can be important and that includes things like blogs and or um, other types of links. I think it's important to intend policymakers discussions, um, whether they're town halls or trying to testify or other things or going to meet with policymakers can be really important. Um, even simple things like press releases, I think, can also be just a track record of this in terms of, of reinforcing messages, trying to get more of these out. And then uh, what we use a lot is research and policy documents. We're kind of pivoting towards like our core messages where the evidence is clear, the urgency is now, and now we have the, uh, the solution that's a data-driven solution. And I think for many of you, you have a lot of data. You may think it's not that powerful, but a simple data point that opens up people's eyes, like for us, a third of families with young children, renter families, are housing unstable. And that's our research, we've published it, but that shocks people that a third of young you know, renter, low-income renter families are housing unstable, and that may affect their mental health now and in the future, can be just a data point that you can use to move forward. And so with that, I'd like to have the last slide. Um, we have really enjoyed being able to talk with you today and share some of our tips about how to use data and effective messaging tools to be effective in making policy change, and we're really excited to open it up for some questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Sandal and Allison. We really, really appreciate it. So I want to go ahead and open it up. And bear with me just a moment while I'm scrolling to get to some questions. We had a couple of questions come into the chat, block, chat box. 
Um, so one of the first questions we have, and feel free to continue to add um, through the question um, area or in the chat box, but one question we had from uh, Chris Weeby, it says, can you say more about what you meant in the beginning about describing problems and solutions on a system level before, the form before forming the narrative? Yeah, so uh, I'll kick it off and then Allison, if you want to jump in if, um, uh, if it needs more work. I think, so for instance, we talk a lot about there being a rising um, uh, number of homeless families, right? And so it's easy to talk about, oh, like, you know, people are working hard, they can't afford their housing, they end up homeless. But if you don't describe it as a system, right? The reason there were a lot of homeless families is that we did not invest in building affordable housing and that wages have not kept up with the cost of housing. So that it's important to pivot up from this is the problem, which is that we have a lot of homeless families, to the systems that are at either that you need to invest in paying people more and to build more affordable housing to fit what people are earning. And that was frankly a choice we made. And now we can make a different choice. So there are new ways in which we can change the system, such as investing in more public housing, more affordable housing vouchers, higher wages, um, maybe more childcare so that people can work um, those are all systems level solutions that therefore solve your problem. And so instead of taking that homeless family who got the affordable housing unit, you then talk about, and this is a system problem because we haven't invested in enough housing. Now we can invest more in housing and see the system do better and that will serve everyone in the community. Yeah, and I think it's important to do that um, sort of before you just start developing sort of your messages and your communication strategies, because one of the things that we've learned in our work is that we, you know, may sort of zoom in on a problem and identify the solution to that problem and then um, inadvertently miss a whole other sort of component of the issue that is really important to start thinking about and building into our narrative. And so I think that um, sort of taking a moment to step back from the problem and sort of start to look a little bit more holistically, a little bit more at the system level, you might start not only to yourself start to see the problem in a, in a different light, but to start to also see the solutions in a new way that's important to build into your communication strategy. So for example, we often talk about um, other, so, so for instance, when we talk about some of our work, we know that for instance, paid family leave is also an important policy solution that we want to be able to build in. It might not be the thing that we're working on all the time where we're working on housing production or housing um, funding for, for housing affordability, but we know that it's an important piece that families need. When you get sick, you need to be able to take a day off. And so when we start to think about how all of this um, pieces of the system start to fit together when when the questions come around well what what about this issue or what about that issue we're able to say right and this is how it all fits together this is what we understand to be a larger system issue and we're asking you to solve it on a larger system um, on a larger system level yeah thank you both so I have a couple other questions and a comment this one comment comes from May Loso she says the one thing that jumps out um, jumps out at me for metaphors is making sure that it makes sense for folks who speak other languages because sometimes it just doesn't make sense at all. Um, so yeah. I think that's an interesting, an interesting comment and an inter and, and it's an interesting perspective that we, we aren't always thinking about when we think about language justice and how we might be practicing that. Um, Megan or, or Allison, do you all have any thoughts or ideas on how you all may have dealt with things like that in the past? Yeah, I think that um, thinking about like cultural sensitivity or even um, uh, so like, for instance, like the word home in Spanish, you can use different words. You can use casa, you can use hogar, you can use other ones in that to an extent um, understanding uh, how a metaphor both linguistically and culturally will land, I do think is really important. Um, the other piece that sometimes comes into play is um, this idea of kind of uh, like families and, and family responsibility and whether or not as we talk about how policies put families in really tough situations around, say, not being able to work because a kid 
who is disabled isn't get, able to get into childcare. So we talk about making available um, childcare for kids who have medically medical complexities, being able to understand that certain families uh, are multi-generational and they, they think that that's the way you take care of it. And so advocating for a policy that is looking for it, they'll just be like, well, why are you doing that? Why aren't you having grandma take care of a, a child? And so being able to, to think about, um, I think both how a metaphor and a policy may be viewed in different cultural contexts and, and other things I think becomes really important. Thank you. I think that's that's so so such an interesting, a great way to put that. I guess. Um, so thank you. Um, we have a couple other questions. Um, it looks like this one comes from Sandy, and Sandy, I apologize if I mispronounce your last name, but uh, Santa Ville. Um, it says, what were those two organizations that Allison mentioned that you, that you all use for language and framing? Um, she said she, she believes Mission Partners was one, but could you share? Um, the names of those organizations that we use for language and framing. Yes, the other one is the Frameworks Institute. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For those that aren't familiar, the Frameworks Institute puts out those, we put out an example of a message map that we developed with mission partners with help from the Butler Family Fund. Um, but Frameworks regularly puts out toolkits around messaging really tough issues that are publicly available. And mm -hmm. so for those that are interested, um, they've recently put out um, uh, frameworks around uh, talking about immigrants mm -hmm. um, or talking about uh, reentry populations yeah. and why certain policies are needed in order to address that and how sometimes the words we use backfire on us and actually demotivate people to help. Whereas if you said things just slightly differently, you could actually motivate people for change. And for this group, uh, I know that Vital Village works with a lot of groups that do work on um, resiliency. They also have work on adverse childhood exper uh, experiences and building re resiliency as well, that they've done a lot of research around messages on those um, topics too. Wonderful. So I'm going to keep the questions rolling. Um, and folks who are participants, please feel free to keep them coming. Um, this question comes to us from Margaret Peterson. She says, have you done data parties or have you gone into communities to share your information or how have you done that? Yeah, I think so. Um, so Children's Health Watch uh, has partnered locally with uh, I think a couple different ways. I think we have partnered locally first and foremost with a kind of sister organization called Witnesses to Hunger, which is um, uh, is where we really think that people with lived experience hold a lot of the, the key solutions to um, being able to solve many issues. And so one of the issues that we'll do is, is bring our data and, and talk it through with people with lived experience so that we can do better interpretation of what does this mean? What are the right policies to recommend to potentially solve some of the associations we'll see between, say, unstable housing and adverse health? Um, it's gotten us so that we've thought more broadly about maybe the pathway to stable homes is actually not just affordable housing units, but maybe childcare, expanding earned income tax credit, and giving better tenant protections, for instance. And that was done through more qualitative research. Um, I think the, or qualitative engagement with people with lived experience, really. Um, I think the other piece is uh, Children's Health Watch has been a, a proud a member of the Vital Village Network. And one of the things that we've heard loud and clear when we talk with uh, community members about data is that they're tired of us framing data in negative ways. So they don't want us to describe our um, relationships as unstable housing and adverse health, which unfortunately is a hard pivot point sometimes for us as researchers um, to do. And you've heard me do it actually negatively during this webinar a bunch. Um, but actually, can you reframe it to the positive? What's the health benefit of kids having stable homes? And you saw that in the message map. We really did try to have a positive frame around the foundations for kids to thrive is a stable home. So you can set roots and you can grow to your strongest tree. Those are, um, that I think more and more as we've done kind of these data outreach is pivot to the positive. Do not describe things negatively. And sometimes there are different pathways to get to an outcome 
and that having more of a, a widespread policy agenda sometimes gets you a little bit closer. We've done a lot of work in earned income tax credit, which if you had told me five years ago we would do, I wouldn't. But sometimes the way to, un to address underlying hardships is just more money, putting the money you've earned back in your pocket. Thank you. So we have a, a question from um, Sharon Hoskins, excuse me, Shannon Hoskins. She says, is the message map um, tool that you all talked about, is it an actual tool that can be shared? Um, and yes, this, our slides will also, slides and a link to this presentation will also be shared um, within the next uh, couple of days. So um, to Megan and Allison, the, the question is around the message map and can that tool be shared? Yes, absolutely. It's publicly available. It's on our website, but I will also send uh, the link directly to Rhonda so she can circulate it with the, the slides as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was on the last slide, but our website's pretty easy. It's all one word, you know, childrenshealthwatch.org. And I think it's one of the featured new publications if you want to find it. So we have another question. This one comes from Anna Spath. It says, does your development or communications department use these messaging te techniques for fundraising communications as well? Yes. <laughs> um, so um, just to be clear, Children's Public is a very small shop. <laughs> so uh, the boundaries between the communications and the development department basically don't exist because they're kind of similar people working mm -hmm. on a lot of these things. But it is something that we have been using um, also in our fundraising efforts because um, you know, just as um, just as policymakers and other people that we communicate with um, who maybe aren't so deep in the weeds on uh, the problems and the solutions, a lot of times our our funders also you know need the the sort of the, that core message, the takeaway, what we're trying to do without all of the jargon and without all of the sort of um, caveats and things around the edges too. They're also looking for. What, are, what is this, the problem and what is the solution and what can I do to help as well? Um, and I think we have a lot of really terrific funders as well that really get the need for, um, for health equity, for racial equity, and sort of we're starting to think more and more about the ways in which we use language and communication to not only advance our, our mission and to sort of achieve the policies that we want, but to ultimately advance equity in our society as well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we uh, are a philanthropically funded organization, and we actively fundraise to get extra resources to do this. So not only does it, I think, impact our work, and we, we try and infuse these lessons in how we're effective with the audience, different audiences that we're engaging with, we're also kind of putting our money where our mouth is. We think this is an important area. Um, I think there's a broader swath of work that people will talk about called narrative change, like can you describe things differently? The example that sometimes people will use in this field is um, uh, gay marriage, that it was described in a frame of justice for a while and it wasn't very effective, didn't really land well with audiences. Um, and then when it got framed in you love who you love, um, it actually changed public opinion a lot. And so I think how we describe things is really important. And so this intentionality of messaging, I think, is something that we need to do more of. And it's hard to do. It's easy to do the pivot points to negativity, the pivot points to telling individual stories, not system stories. Um, and I think that intentionality is what we need to do to be more effective. Um, so we have another question, and this one's around words that matter. Um, what additional resources might you all have around um, words that matter? I know you talked about a few things earlier, but are there additional resources? Yeah, again, I think I would point to um, groups like the Frameworks Institute and Mission Partners. I think the Frameworks Institute in particular, a lot of their reports have components where it is really here are the words that matter. Here are the things that we tested that um, that landed with people. And so the way they do their work is they do message testing. They develop messages. They sort of do deep research on the language that people are using um, to describe certain things. And then they test those in real life to see what's landing and what's not. And so they often sort of in the, the analysis that they're the analyses that they're doing, 
present, you know, here's what here's the here's what people sort of perked up on and here's what really kind of fell flat. And so I would I would direct people to to those resources as well for those kinds of things too. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna give a shout out to there is um the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation funded a commission on social determinants of health in the late two thousands, uh early twenty ten era. And they put out a, a messaging uh, framework around social determinants of health. Um, I'll dig up the PDF, send it on to Rhonda, and uh, we'll post it to uh, this webinar. But I go back to that document over and over again because it was so good. I spend a lot of time in Children's Health Watch. We spend a lot of time on social determinants of health um, and the fact that there are really key ways to talk about it. And so. Um, even like talking about concepts of fairness is a way to describe things that tend to go across the political aisle and political spectrum um, versus talking about investing um, and things like that. And so it's just, I think, I think there are resources out there. Um, uh, that's one that I find particularly effective. I've heard more recently uh, in North Carolina that North Carolina Blue Cross Blue Shield did some messaging research and even said we shouldn't call them social determinants we should call them social drivers of health and that that resonated with people better. So I think this is honestly an unending field, but I do think that um, uh, being thoughtful about what words you choose actually is worth the effort and time. Wonderful. So uh, and we had lots of questions come in and it sounds like you all have, have answered them well. Um, so as we begin to wrap up, um, Megan or Allison, are there any last thoughts or anything that's just really resonating with you, with you that you haven't shared yet that you'd like to share um, with our network before we move into closing? Yeah. Oh, I'll say a couple of things, and then I, I definitely want to invite my my co-panelists mm -hmm. to to chime in. I think I, I think there are kind of uh, three things that I just want to kind of emphasize. The title of this webinar was data, integrating data into um, uh, kind of communication storytelling so that you can be effective. And I do think data is really important. I think where sometimes there are pitfalls with data is we use too much data, right? Like we, we think that if we give you like 10 data points, that's somehow going to make you more likely to think things that are uh, to change your mind. And I actually think there's pretty good research to say no less is more so focus on a couple of key data points that are um, that are doing it and don't over complicate them like again as, as physicians and researchers we sometimes over complicate them no keep it simple so don't say three thirty three point two percent say one out of three right think ways in which you can remember them um, I think the second is, is that data should be used towards a core message data is not the the lead Right? It is the core message that's the lead and the data reinforces the message. And so that's why this was so focused on core message development, how you describe the problem and the system you're trying to solve, who's your audience, what's the core message, how do you communicate it maybe with a metaphor, and then you can use a data point to describe how common the problem is, how urgent the problem is, and how, how it's solvable but data is not the lead, data is the support. And then I do think that um, uh, as you think about your allies, I think people with lived experience with you in data, um, particularly around good data, um, uh, that with good messaging, and it's not just messaging, it's messengers. So how do you be able to uh, bring new messengers and the, the people that we all serve are great messengers if they can feel comfortable with those messages. And I think that that, that is, um, as we've seen over and over again, when we reflect on where we've been effective, it's because we've kept those three things in mind. Mm -hmm. Great, and I just wanna thank um, Vital Village for inviting us to participate in this webinar. Um, I hope that if you see the slides, we did include our email address and we're happy to respond to emails. I know that 
Um, we, we talk about two things that um, some people tend to be a little afraid of, data, which can be daunting, and policy, which can also be daunting. But rest assured, you have all of the tools within you and within your communities that you need to solve big problems. Um, we are happy to just provide any sort of thoughts or insights or guidance on how to move those things from your vision, from your thoughts, from your um, from the things that you know about um, the groups that you work with, and into policy change. And um, so, please feel free to reach out to us um, at following this webinar with any additional questions. So, thank you. Well, there's one more question that came in that I just really want to share. Of <laughs> one last question that popped in, it said, "What percentage of the core message do you think data should be ideally?" Yeah, it's a great question. I I tend to so first of all, I think um, uh, in some ways, uh, someone that once describes kind of data is a story with a face, um, uh, and I think that uh, that to an extent you want to use data in a, um, in a way to drive your message home. I think sometimes a qualitative story with a data point in it can be effective also. But I, I would not, it, it's more about um, what your message is and then a few points of data, one or two, maybe three that are driving home um, and that you, I think sometimes arguments are too data heavy. Again, it's like say fewer things more often can be more effective than saying more things. And so I do think that um, just being really thoughtful about what data you choose. I think the only other caveat I'll put is your data should be pretty, um, I sometimes say data should be somewhat uncontroversial um, because you don't want to have to defend your data points. You want to feel pretty confident that your data point is right mm -hmm. and that it it makes sense. Um, I think if you put up a data point that that is just like clangs and doesn't really make sense, you'll spend most of your time defending the data point instead of talking about your core message. And so keep it simple. Don't overcomplicate it. It shouldn't be that controversial of a, of a data point. It's a data point that's driving home your message. And I think, as Allison said, I, I, I don't think you have to do a lot of data collection. Mm -hmm. I think you know a lot of the stuff already, many of you in your communities. It's just putting it into the right framework where someone's like, oh, I didn't realize that. Wow, that is a big problem. Wow, this is solvable. Here's the solution of how to do it. And so the data is really about how to drive that conversation. It shouldn't be, do not bury your lead, which is your core message. Just use data as a way to drive it home. Yeah, and I think vice versa too, that the, the data and what you're learning should also inform your core message so that they are you know, synergistic with one another, that um, it really kind of makes sense to tell a story. So I don't wanna put a like, what proportion of your core message or of your supporting points should be data. I really think that that is, you know, um, sort of something that as you're preparing, as you're starting to understand what what is the problem, what is the solution, who is the audience, what do they care about, those are the things that are going to start to inform, you know, the how, what data you use and those supporting points that are really going to drive the core message and the ways in which data is used to, to develop and create the core message that you're trying to communicate in the first place. Wonderful. Well, thank you all. Thank you, ladies, so much for for spending some time with us today and sharing your wisdom and knowledge and expertise with our network. We sincerely appreciate you. Um, for those of you who are listening, if you want to share this webinar, please feel free to do that. We'll be sending out a link uh, shortly within the next couple of days. And if you want to learn more about our work or more about um, Children's Health Watch, please visit us at network www.networksofopportunity.org. Um, and you can also follow us on Twitter. Um, all of our handles are on your screen. Thank you all so much. Have a great rest of your day and a great weekend. And we will look forward to talking to you soon. Bye, everyone. Bye.